Hey and welcome. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how I like to mix the GGD P5 Matt Halpin Signature Drum Library. And I'm going to be doing that by mixing that library into an actual mix session from the Periphery 5 album mix. I'm going to be working on the song Wildfire, which is the first song on the record, the first single. I think for many people, one of the most memorable tracks on the record too. Now something pretty cool is we're also going to be making the actual drum MIDI and the producer pack stems from this song. So those are kind of bounce down mix stems of the rest of the session so that you can have a go mixing along and hopefully get results that sound really close to the record too. So check below in the video description to get your link to access those files. So I think a key place to start would be to look at the actual library itself. So I'm using uh, the second preset on the menu here. It's called Wildfire because it's the exact kit setup that we used on Wildfire. So it's the cymbal selection and the rack tom selection and the snare tuning. If you want to get more information about all of the different options which are available within this library, we've got a good walkthrough video on that that you can watch as well, which will get linked. Um, but for now, I'll just leave it there, apart from to say that I'm using the Turbo Off preset. So there's not going to be Turbo Active on any of the channels. Again, if you want an explanation of that, check out the walkthrough video. In the mixer tabs, I have for the most part flattened out the faders. So on the cymbal page, you can see everything's at unity. On the tom page, everything's at unity. On the snare, I've left the snare bottom trimmed back a little bit. And you also see I've given the snare just a little bit of a boost in the far room mic, so rooms one and two. And on the kick, I've done kind of the opposite. So yes, I've trimmed back the kick out, kind of left it at the default position, but I've also brought back the level of the kick drum a little bit in those room mics. So this is just to make things a little bit more hyper real, a bit easier to work with. The kick drum can sometimes get a little bit too boomy sounding in room tracks, and you can have to figure out other ways of dealing with that. And likewise, um, it's helpful to have the snare cut through just a little bit more. I've left the panning exactly as it would be if you were to load up this preset. And then as far as the outputs go, I have got, coming down into Logic, I've got kick routed out, so that's the kick in and kick out going to one channel. Then I have independent channels for the snare top and bottom, independent channels for each tom. Then when it comes to the cymbals, I've got the hi-hat on its own channel, and then I've put all the rest, the splash, ride, crash, ride, stack, uh, sent to a spots, like a spot mic channel, followed by the overheads and mono tracks, each going to their own outputs. But then I've put both room one and two to a single fader for stereo room sound. I think next it would be good to take a bit of a zoomed out look at what's going on on the master bus and on the instrumental bus, because for those of you that have followed my mixing tutorials in the past, you might be aware that I like to do something which I and many other people refer to as top-down mixing. Although, more recently, I've kind of stopped thinking of it quite so much of that, not least because I've changed certain aspects of my signal chain, which we'll talk about, but also because maybe to me, the purest form of top-down mixing would be to level all the faders as you want in the mix, listening to it with nothing on the master chain or on the instrumental bus. Or no, no plugins, no processing active at all. And then start messing with the EQ of everything together, listening to it and making decisions on the EQ points and frequency boosts and cuts that you use. I don't do that. I have a really specific set of processing that I like to do. It gets thrown on every mix I do. So yeah, it's I'm just making a slightly critical difference there between me getting, you know, starting to twiddle knobs and, you know, choose frequencies at that point before looking at any of the individual channels, um, as opposed to kind of having like a, an almost like a, a filter, like a preset that I'm putting on everything and then working from there. Subtle difference, I know. Um, and you can call it whatever you like. But with no further ado, um, let's take a look first at the instrumental bus. So unlike in the past where I had some EQ added on the instrumental bus, I now just have compression. And to clarify, the instrumental bus is receiving everything apart from vocals. The only other thing that sometimes ends up outside the instrumental bus is if I've got a transition track, you know, like a, say a stereo file that contains some sound effects or a little transition piece of music that's intended to bridge the gap between this song and the next. 
and that's already been fully mixed and everything and it's just a question of you know kind of dovetailing it in in the session maybe that's not going to go through my instrumental bus kind of depends what's going on but in this session everything barring vocals is going through these two processes so the first one is um, the Slate VBC FG Grey. Again, if you've seen my previous mix tutorials, this is not going to be shocking at all. I've been using this for the best part of 10 years now with the same settings. So fast attack, that's a 0.3 millisecond attack, super fast. Fastest release, 0.1 um, millisecond release. No, 0.1 sec. Hmm, good question. I think that's a 0.3 millisecond and this is a 100 millisecond release. Um, and then threshold dialed in to taste, I'll talk about that in a sec, and uh, ratio of four to one. And then crucially, one of the things that first turned me onto this compressor was the sidechain high pass filter at 60 hertz, which means that low end beneath 60 hertz is being rolled off in what the compressor is seeing. It's not taking it out of the mix, but it just prevents the kick from pumping the mix too hard, which is something that I always battled with before using this. The main thing I'm using this compressor for is to duck the snare drum when it hits. That's not to say other things don't trigger it as well. But the reason why I put this here is that fast attack is going to knock down the snare and volume. And because it's on a bus with everything else going through it, it's going to knock down everything else at the same time. So the effect is the snare is going to maintain a lot of headroom above the mix, but the whole mix gets turned down at that instant. At that instant and the result is you get the effect of the snare drum cutting through as though it was really loud but it's not really jumping out and kind of harshly, aggr aggressively attacking your ears. Now, it does actually have like a certain cool envelope character to it, because obviously you could just use a limiter or something to achieve that effect. There is a certain something to the way this does that that's more than just a transparent knocking down to the snare level. But that's the main goal. And I'm usually aiming for about three or four dBs of gain reduction on the snare drum. If I didn't have the sidechain... Um, knocking off below 60 hertz, um, then we'd probably be seeing the kick triggering perhaps even more compression than the snare, and that's not what I want at all. You get that really dizzying kind of pumping uh, character to the compression. And then I've got this FG Grey followed up by FG Red. This is based on the Focusrite Red compressor. Um, and this was intended, this is something I brought in for the Periphery 4 mix. So I probably went over it in the previous mix tutorial as well where basically I wanted to blend a very aggressively pumpy distortion sound, distortion? Compression sound, onto the mix to give it a little bit of kind of pumping life and energy. Um, but I didn't want to have that on a full mix. So I've dialed it in to, to do some pretty aggressive um, pumping. You know, the needles are going to be moving quite aggressively. And then I'm blending in the mix so that it's just quite a quiet little effect in the mix. Okay, so having waffled about that for a second, uh, I'm going to now hit play and you'll be able to see the meter's moving on these compressors and you'll get an idea of what they're doing. Cool, so as you can see, hitting three, maybe occasionally four dBs of compression on the first one. Um, the second one is doing quite a lot more. I'll show you what happens if I uh, increase the mix up to full so you can just hear that compression effect. And then I'll turn it back I'll turn it off entirely, turn it back on again, and bring the mix down. yet it's definitely there it's kind of sucking <laughs> sucking the guitars down on the you know on the chugs and kind of making the whole mix interact in a certain way when i turn it off things arguably sound a bit more kind of pristine but i like the energy which is which that is giving and i've been using this kind of chain of compressors on my uh, on my instrumental bus now for many years with great happiness so uh, that's what's on my instrumental bus. I'm mixing into that. I'm just making sure that my gain levels are right so that, you know, I'm getting about one dB of reduction on the kick on the FG Grey, three or four dBs of reduction on the snare, 
and that's how I know that my gain staging is pretty much right. Let's look now at the master bus. So um, let's start with the easiest to explain. I've got a Fab Filter Pro L2 in modern mode. This is on there to give level to my mix. This is the last thing on my chain. I'm boosting it 9 dB. Um, we'll have a look, a look at a second at how many dBs of reduction are going on there. But I'm not aiming to squeeze my mix to any huge extent. I'm typically getting around minus 10 luffs. And this is something which is only there for mixing. I love to mix into a limiter because it means I can judge how my transient should sound so that once this gets sent to a professional mastering engineer, they still sound right, you know, after they've done their thing, making the track sound loud. Um, so this is the one thing that gets bypassed when I send my mix to mastering. Everything else remains in place. Um, just before that in the chain is this slate virtual tape machines. This is another thing I've been doing for the best part of 10 years. Um, I just love what this does to the sound of my mixes. Again, it gives it just a little bit of glue, a little bit of an extra low bump. It does depend on where you set the various um, switches and knobs on this. Um, as you can see, I've got it just set at Unity, normal bias. I've got it on the half inch two track tape, so that would be your kind of master style tape. And that one in particular gives a little bit of a low bump, which is nice. The tape type, I like the FG456. That to me sounds a little bit more mid-range forwards than the FG9, which adds quite a lot of sparkle on the top. It's not a subtle difference. Um, that other mode I've used occasionally on mixes that need to sound a bit more hi-fi, but um, almost all the time it stays in the 456 tape type and at 30 ips. You can do 15 ips if you want. Again, that's going to kind of reinforce the mid-range, roll off a bit of top end and sometimes give it more of a low end bump as well. But these are the general settings that I aim for. And then before that, so <laughs> I've gone in reverse order here. The first thing that my mix is hitting on the master bus is this instance of Gulfos, which to me is, it's a game changer, but it's also kind of subtle. Um, so <laughs> it's one of those things that once you have it on, you're not going to want to turn it off, but it doesn't make my mix fall apart when I bypass it. So what Gulfos is, is one of these kind of new generations of plugins that seeks to maintain a certain frequency balance in your music. Um, so it's kind of dynamically EQing both sides independently, I believe, um, in such a way as to try and kind of reduce any area from becoming too overbearing. And it has the effect of enhancing the clarity of your mix by, I think, just keeping certain frequency bands in check. And it also has this brilliant effect, which I particularly love on um, really diverse music or tracks that have a big kind of scene changes, like in Wildfire, where it goes to a jazz break. If you know the song, you know what I mean. Um, because what this does is it kind of smooths out the global EQ differences between those tracks. It could be something as simple as, you know, a song distorted guitars in the intro and then they drop out classic loud quiet loud quiet kind of structure to a song um i find that golfos just really helps smooth over those changes in instrumentation in such a way that your mix sounds a bit more like you went to town automating stuff when all you did was have this on there i by default i don't know why that's set to 19 by default have this set to have both recover and tame set to 20 percent maybe a little bit of extra brightness that just tilts it towards the, the brightness a little bit. And then I tend to bracket off above about 12K because it can have a habit of introducing a certain kind of glossy top end that sounds nice, but isn't necessarily what I intended and perhaps sometimes can kind of change a more dark or traditional cymbal sound into something that's a bit more hi-fi. I just don't see the need for it to kind of determine that stuff that's way up there. Um, on some material, I will bracket off low end as well. But for the most part, I very gratefully enjoy its feedback and, and it's, uh, you know, whatever it does on my mix in terms of keeping the low end hitting in a certain way. And as I say, smoothing out differences between sections. So it's a really cool plugin, uh, one which I've been using for a few years now since it came. Well, maybe not since it came out, but soon after it came out. And to me, uh, it's something I... I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't say I wouldn't mix 
with without it, but I really, really appreciate having it. So uh, let's bypass both Gulf Force and um, the tape machine. I don't see the point in bypassing the limiter and just making things quiet and loud for you. So um, I'll leave that on. You'll be able to see on the meters how much it's doing as I hit play. So um, first thing I'll do is bring in um, Gulf Force, actually. And remember, the tape machine comes after that. So it is kind of getting... Instead of it counteracting the coloration of the tape machine, it's kind of being coloured by it. So first thing I'll bring in is Gulf Force and then Tape Machine, um, and you'll hear the difference. Yeah. I should have said, by the way, that Gulf Force kind of looks crazy when there's no music playing, <laughs> but it's definitely not doing that uh, to the mix when it's playing. As you can see, it's a lot more close. I mean, th what's this? The first line on either side of the midpoint is 3 dB. Um, so a lot of the moves are happening within kind of plus or minus 2 dB, but I think it is quite transparent. You guys tell me if you think that I'm, I'm a fraud and that Gulf Force is mixing for me. Um, I don't think that's quite the case, but I do love it. And then the tape machine again, I just absolutely love what that setting does. There's a reason I've used it for all this time. It just makes the kick sound that much more kind of thick. Um, it pushes the mids forwards. It does make it a little bit louder. You know, I'm not not going to pretend I don't notice that, um, that, you know, that there is a slight level change as you process and bypass it. But um, yeah, I just really love what that does. And then the master uh, limiter would seem to be doing about... 60 B of gain reduction kind of thing. So that's what's going on on a top level on my mixes. Let's start looking at drums. So drum bus. At the moment, by the way, I do have plugins on. So this is the kind of mix sound that I'm going to be aiming for and showing you how to achieve. Um, I'm doing that just because it seems to make more more sense to show you these kind of higher stage things, the mix um, bus compression, uh, now the drum compression I'm going to show you, on a sound that's already sounding pretty good. Um, but later on I'm going to get rid of all of those and we'll uh, talk about how to get from raw to these sounds. So let's talk about drum bus processing. You may well have seen me using these plugins before. If you watch the P4... Mix Masterclass, or recently my snare processing video. I think I showed you these things there. However, in the interest of showing people what I'm doing that haven't seen any of the other videos, uh, I'm going to run through it. But I'm also not going to go into crazy amounts of detail. So look out for some of those older videos if you want to get more information. Um, but importantly, my parallel drum compression is happening directly on the bus now. In the past, when I've done mix walkthroughs, such as on Nail the Mix or Creative Live, I was using the soft tube FET compressor on a parallel bus, and I was sending different amounts of each channel and loads of snare drum to that. I'm now no longer doing that. I now have this on my drum bus. Setting the record straight, because I've seen a few people uh, telling people that I do what I used to do when it's now this, all the time. So I use the um, Distressor plugin model by Slate Digital with some settings which I pretty much robbed from Eric Valentine in his video when he went through how he mixes drums. He has his hardware pair next to him. If I remember correctly, and I probably should have checked this first, he actually has the attack as slow as it can go and the release as fast as it can go. But for whatever reason, I've ended up with these settings where the attack is at eight and the release is at about two and a half. I've got, apart from that, the settings the same as him. So it's the 20 to one ratio, so pretty extreme limiting. And in the detector chain, so the side chain, um, there's a high pass filter and this kind of mid bump or, or a band pass. I, I don't really know what that is. But basically the signal 
is not being treated, you know, the compressor is not seeing the full frequency range of my drum mix. And that, I think, is crucial to why it sounds so good, because the reason why most people do their compression on a separate bus and send different amounts of each drum is to be able to not get the kick making making the bus um, compress too hard or to be able to get the snare drum to trigger more of that compression. And this just does it wonderfully as is. I'm using the mix set quite low. I think here it's 32%. I'm usually between 25 and 40%. I try and get it level matched so that when I turn the plug-in on and off, the level doesn't change too much. Well, the perceived level doesn't change too much. Just as a note, I don't know how true this is, but when I've tried to match these settings with a generic compressor, I found that at 20 to 1, I need to make the knee quite soft to match this. So something's telling me that although it's a high ratio, it's not a super hard knee kind of limiting style might be wrong about that. That's just what's, you know, it's very difficult to really replicate the sound of one compressor with complicated behavior with another, because the way that it kicks in, the way that it accelerates in and out can be so unique. So that's why I kind of always come back to using this one. And it should be said, I don't, I don't really know how close this sounds to Eric Valentine's hardware compressors set the way he does them. But I've really gotten into how this sounds and I use it all the time as I say and it seems that when other people try this as well on my recommendation they seem to really like it as well. The other thing I'd say is that although the attack sounds like it's pretty slow at 8 out of 10, again if I try and mimic this with a generic compressor I find my attack time has to be pretty fast, somewhere between, well somewhere under 10 milliseconds, put it that way, maybe closer to like 3 or 4. It seems that as you open it up to 10 there's quite a big change so I don't know if that knob kind of increases exponentially towards the end in terms of attack time. I don't know. But that is very much a part of my, my drum mix sound these days. Following that is a couple of instances of EQ. So these used to live on my instrumental chain. I used to EQ some 12k and some 5.5k and a bit of a 100-ish kind of bump into my whole mix, uh, apart from vocals. And over time I've moved away from doing that. I just found that it's, most, it's mostly my drums that benefit from those moves. So now I just do that to my drums only and nothing else is getting EQ'd, apart from the kind of natural EQ characteristics going through Golfos and the tape machine on the master chain. So drums are going through these. The Neve style EQ here in particular has a very uh, colourful, aggressive, brash, I think, sound to it, especially on this mid-range band. Uh, these two are clones of each other, but that 5.5k boost, which, oop, I moved it, which says it's under 2dB, to me sounds more like a, you know, you're cranking something. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but it, it feels like quite a, a heavy-handed move, that one. Um, and then I really like the sound of the 12k band on this custom series equalizer. It's like a weird shelf, if I remember correctly. It's not just an average shelf. It's kind of somewhere between a bell and a shelf, if I remember correctly. And I just really like how that sounds. On some mixes, I find it necessary to add a bit of 60 hertz on this low frequency um, section here. But on this one, I didn't seem to find that necessary. So that's the processing that's going on on my drum mix bus. So I'll bypass it, hit, hit play and then stick it back on again, and then I'll also bypass the compressor on its own. Cool. Let's move on then. So, Let's get rid of that and let's take a listen to the raw kick drum. So when I say raw from now on, you're always still going to be hearing it with these things on. So it's not truly, truly raw, but um, if you mix these settings um, and you have the library, then this will be the sound that you have as raw when you're working on it as well. Let's listen to the kick as it is coming out of contact. And I'm just going to reiterate something that I say in every video, which is don't program everything super, super hard hitting. 
the kicks here are programmed at 99, 102, 100, round about 100 um, on the velocity scale here. And that's going to give us the kind of sound we want. And as, here's a little tip. Even drummers that hit really hard with their hands, that doesn't necessarily mean they're kicking with all their strength either. Some drummers really work on that. They kick incredibly hard. I don't even know if that necessarily sounds good. I really like how Matt plays kick drum. He's not hitting it super, super hard. And in fact, his, you know, his, the strength he's able to get hitting the rest of the kit comes out of the size of his body, the length of his arms, and his kind of whip technique with his hands. He's not really kind of tensed up hitting really hard. It's this flowing motion that's just got a lot of acceleration on it. So he's not someone that kicks super hard, and I think he sounds better for that than a lot of other drummers. So let's look at some processing. That's the raw kick drum. One of the things which I wanted to make a note of here was that obviously I had a gate on the natural kick track. Um, and on something like a kick drum, that has quite a big effect on the envelope, like the how long the low end blooms for. So I thought it was important to keep a gate on this sample, even though I'm not trying to gate out any bleed, um, because that would just help us get a bit closer to the kind of sound on the record. So with the gate on. This is, by the way, a preset that I use most of the time on kick drum. It's not got any hold time, any knee, any attack time. It's got a release time of about 350 milliseconds and a little bit of overhead. Sorry, overhead? A little bit of look ahead. The range is set to 50 dB and the ratio is at 10 to 1. Um, so it's mostly just trimming some of the kind of sustain, the head flap off the kick drum. I love how this kick sounds, by the way. This one is with an Evans UV EMAD head on it and as we'll get into when we talk about EQing, that head versus some of the other types of heads that don't have a kind of foam damping ring on them. Um, this one that does has a kind of flatter response in the presence region. It's not as immediately clicky or slappy sounding, but it gives you a beautiful blank canvas to sculpt a kick drum sound out of. So uh, that's what we're gonna get into next by looking at some EQ moves. That's where I ended up but let's go to a blank bit here so that I can talk you through in real time. So let's just look at how this is looking on the graph. I mean, I know that this is sounding a bit dull just hearing it, you know, that doesn't sound like a, a really powerful, aggressive kick drum sound yet. Um, so I'm expecting to see that the low end and the top end are quite out of balance just visually on this. And my usual thing is to try and get them to look similar in terms of the peaks at the top and the bottom. But there's so much more to it than that. Our ear can hear so much detail uh, within all of the nooks and crannies of the EQ spectrum. So it's going to come down to shaping it to give the sound that we want. I can see, firstly, there's quite a lot of energy above 100 hertz, kind of between 100 and 200. And that's going to give it this kind of uh, slightly tubby character, which isn't really what you want once you try and start fitting other other aspects of the mix around it. So, um, you know, getting the bass to sit in there well. So if we can trim back a little bit of that, it's going to give the kick drum this kind of deeper and clearer sound just by not having those kind of muddy frequencies a bit above the fundamental of the drum, which is something that we're going to come back to, by the way, once we get to talking about floor toms. So keep that in mind. But um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, yeah, just make a cut somewhere in that 100 to 200 range. By doing that, it's like we've uncovered the fundamental, like the low punch of the kick. So that's a really important move. The next thing, something I really like to do, if I want to just rebalance this kick drum sound a little bit so bring up the important kind of frequencies that are you know part of the presence aspects of the kick drum is just to use a big old shelf at around about 1k that tends to be the kind of dividing line between 
unpleasant mids and kind of important mids in terms of the kick drums representation in the mix. So let's do that. I'm going to make a, a shelf at 1k. sounding pretty good but the attack's a little bit kind of papery for me. I just want to try rebalancing it and I will say I wanted the kick drum on P5 to be kind of meaty sounding, not too clicky. It's something which other people seem to have noticed about it as well and seem to like so what I found was that in order to get that I wanted to focus the energy so that the kind of the main thrust of the attack felt around that kind of 3k area not the kind of five, six, seven K area, which is what I'm currently hearing in this kick drum and seeing on the graph. So let's see if we can redress that balance a little bit. That's the stuff I'm not really going for. You see what that's done? It's like we've taken some click out, but we've given it more of this kind of wider, slappier kind of character to it with that 3K kind of thing. There's a kind of note somewhere that came up when I brought that, that high shelf. Um, so I'm just gonna try and track that down because I'm not finding it very pleasant. It kind of sounds like a weird kind of head resonance or something. that's sounding quite a lot better. And then something which I noticed, I made a note about, I guess, I don't know if this was because of a note from someone in the band, or if it was just something that occurred to me. But in order to kind of add to this meaty kind of slap, I found it was quite useful to pick out somewhere, you know, I might usually give a boost around kind of 1k or something, but this was a bit lower than that it was about 800. And in fact, I think I do kind of remember where it came from. And I think it was based around a couple of one shot samples that I had in my library made by somebody else that I liked the sound of. Um, and it just seemed to have more in that area than I had. So maybe just a different mic or different treatment. So that was kind of the EQ vibe that, uh, that I found myself going to in the mix. So let's see what that's like if I bypass it. So at the moment it's sounding a bit weird, I think. And the reason for that is because we haven't got any kind of compression on there. When I say weird and the reason why, what I mean is if you compare that to the album, it doesn't sound right yet because that without some compression on it just doesn't have the right kind of attack character. Um, so one more thing, I'm just gonna show you bypassing just the stuff which I've been doing kind of in the upper end of the, of the, the kick drum sound so you can hear so you can hear that basically while maintaining this low end bump and um, low mid kind of upper bass cut. So it's so much more slappy sounding. All right, so I've already given the game away as to the three plugins that come next. But first of all, I really like to use this Revival plugin. Um, this Shimmer band is really high up there in the EQ spectrum. And it's one of those things that once you hear it, you hear it in other people's mixes all the time. There's like a certain quality to top end, especially if you put it on something like a vocal or cymbals or a whole mix that, yeah, there's certain mixers out there that I'm, I'm pretty sure are using this um, quite a lot because it's, it's just such a specific sound. But it can be very cool on drum shells that maybe don't have, you know, it's not a cymbal or something that's got crazy harmonics up in the top end. It can be a really nice way of bringing 
it's not even it's not even click. It's something higher than that um, that can just sound really lovely without adding to like the pointiness of the sound. So that's why I quite like it here. Um, again, this is something which I did on the album. Yeah, a little goes a long way with that. Um, the next thing was to saturate the kick, and I chose to distort it quite a lot. Again, I want a meaty texture to it. By saturating it, we're creating lots of harmonics based on the frequency content of the sound. So that low end, if we add these kind of dense harmonics to them, it can just make it sound just thick in a cool way without having just lots of frequencies up around that, yeah, that kind of 200 hertz-ish range. Um, that make things sound boxy at the same time. And it can also have this cool way of kind of splatting the attack a little bit so that the attack of the kick drum just sounds a bit more pleasing, a little bit less pokey. And then that into compression can be really cool. So let's check out what this is doing to, um, to saturate the kick sound. I really like that. And I love this this Hollywood model in particular. Um, I've spoken about this recently in, you know, EQing the snare drum. I think I used this uh, in that video and I've used it on lots of mixes recently and I just really like how that sounds. And then I'm following that up with the custom Opto compressor. So I, yeah, I don't know why, but I just love the sound of optical compressors on kick drums. They seem to do a really cool thing to the attack. And this one, um, it's kind of replaced what I was using before, which was the Klanghelm MGUC. Again, a great plugin. It's just kind of easy. Once you have this environment like the mix rack, it just kind of makes sense to keep all of your plugins in there. So it doesn't take very much. I'm basically aiming for kind of maximum 3 dB reduction, maybe a tiny bit more. Uh, high ratio, kind of setting the speed to taste. And this tone knob can be really cool for dialing in how much aggression you want on your kick drum, in this case, lots. So. Uh, let's see what it sounds like without and then with. And that is, you know, the piece in the puzzle that makes the kick EQ work really well, because it just has a way of you know, all of that attack that we dialed in, in those kind of knocky areas and slappy areas of the kick drum, and now being focused into a really short little impulse at the front of the kick drum sound. And it's just so satisfying on the ear in a way that kind of sounded a bit hard edged and weird before. So let's listen to how that kick drum sounds um, in the context of the rest of the mix. Right, so that's kick drum done. Um, let's look at the snare drum. So we're using the mid tune drum in this one. Um, and it doesn't take much work to get the snare to sound really good. And I kind of put that down to, you know, it's, it's the whole chain really from the drummer, the drum, it's Matt's signature drum, which I think sounds fantastic. Um, we had the Evans heavyweight dry head on it, which I think sounds really good, it was mic'd with the Neumann KMS-105 on top, which for me is just, yeah, a godlike snare top mic. Thankfully that was uh, shown to me by Pete Miles from Middle Farm and I'm internally grateful um, that he discovered how great that sounds on snare and passed the info on because, yeah, what you're hearing is a raw snare top signal. I didn't do any processing to it on the way in. That's just how great it sounds. The snare bottom is a Shaw Beta 87A it's a handheld condenser, a bit like that Neumann is supposed to be. Um, sounds really good on snare bottom. It's what Periphery Sound Guy um, Alex Marchides used on snare bottom uh, when I was playing live in the band and we always thought that sounded great. So knowing that Real World had one of those, I thought it would be pretty cool to use that. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the raw snare, again, remember this is going through the um, EQ and parallel compression on the drum bus, but raw, as far as I'm concerned snare sounds like this. Uh, 
And to me, it's just, it's got such a lovely weight to the attack without being muddy. The snare wires sound crisp. There's some overtones and life to it, but not something which is going to, you know, no one's going to complain about a St. Anger snare at the same time. The attack doesn't have, you know, if you see my snare EQing video, it doesn't really have any of the problem areas sticking out to a huge extent. Like there's not a kind of clacky or a ticky kind of attack like you might get from dynamic mics. And it's pretty clear as well. That said, it's not a final sound. So let's look at what I thought would be good to do to the snare mics to get this to work well in the mix. So the first thing, just looking at the snare top, was I chose to saturate it a little bit. And I used this new style preamp like emulation within the Slate Virtual Mix Rack, letting that go into the red on the hits. And that's just gonna trim a little bit of transient off. This is something which I did on the mix, um, partly just to help control the levels a little bit to make sure that any variations in hit intensity are being smoothed out a little bit but also because I just like how that sounds. And it doesn't take a huge amount on this microphone. Again, if it was a dynamic mic, you might find you want to be a bit more heavy handed. But without, but with it, and then let's see EQ wise. Let's, let's just do the thing which I did in that video where I put a transient designer on the snare bus and turn the, the sustain all the way down so that we can just hear um, just the attack portion and see how that might be getting affected. Um, let's also find a section where there's quite a few uh, snares being hit. This is what to do. If this wasn't for metal, like if this was, or if this was like a drum video or something, I might not see the need to do anything to that signal. But in order to just make it sound a bit more like a contemporary metal thing, I think it does make sense to kind of nip out a bit of this kind of 550 hertz area. So I'll boost it so you can see really what I'm, what I'm going for there. But like I say, I don't see the need to cut anything like higher up. It's just such a balanced sound. And look, if anybody watching this works at Neumann or knows somebody that does, please make a short version of this microphone for use on snare top. I will yell about it from mountaintops to get that to be a thing. Please make it a thing. I will certainly at least buy one. Anyway, um, yeah, just that's all that really kind of sticks out as needing to be done. Um, let's check out the snare bottom and I'm just gonna bypass this transient designer and then stick back on again. So with nothing. There is a bit of a kind of, it's just easier to show you, but there's this kind of, um, it's like somewhere between like an O and a U sound, like an O, 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 O kind of sound. And then I, I feel like it could just have a little bit more brightness to it. One of the things with the condenser is you get a nice airy top, but you don't get a presence bump in the same way that you get from using a dynamic mic. So maybe just somewhere around five, six K kind of thing. That's interesting. So that setting is what I had on the record and that's what's come to mind now. So apparently my taste has shifted downwards, but, um, can't imagine that's going to make a huge difference. Again, just sounds so good. 
All right, so that snare top and bottom with some kind of preliminary stuff done to them, and that's feeding through to a snare bus. Um, so a bit like with a kick drum, I feel like putting a gate on there is going to help stay kind of true to the original. The gate would have been there to control bleed, but yeah, um, in this case, it's just going to change the envelope of the drum a little bit. This is a preset I've been using for, wait for it, four years since 2019. Um, no hold time, no attack time. Look ahead on, but no milliseconds dialed in. That's weird, but I'm not going to change it now. And um, release time set to 184 milliseconds. Now, importantly, the range is only set to 13 dB, and the ratio is pretty low, 1.72 to 1. Um, I've got the side chain cutting off a bit of top and bottom end. This is really to help deal with crosstalk from other instruments. So this is a setting I would use on a live drum kit, but um, it just seems to work really well here as well. And then dialing in the ratio so that everything that's a hard hit is above the knee and then ghost notes will be falling below that. And that's actually helpful because bringing them down in volume means that once the kit goes through parallel compression, you know, the, there's still some difference between the hard hits and the soft hits, which, especially the way I used to do it before, if I didn't have the gate on, this the parallel compression chain would make the hard hits and the ghost notes almost equal in volume. So having the gate kind of exaggerate the difference helps here. Cool. This, you can just hear the gate kind of cutting off a bit of the tail of the drum there. Next up, let's load up an EQ, and I'm not going to look at it for too long. It's gone. It's gone. Uh, I'm now going to EQ from scratch on the snare bus. So let's use the transient designer thing again. Sustain on zero, and let's evaluate the various ranges of the drum. So that's sounding pretty good to kind of suppress the mids in a, in a way that's kind of making that sound a bit more woody in a way. I mean, it's a metal drum. I'm not saying it's making it sound like a wood drum, but just kind of like it's got this kind of satisfying hollowness to it, I guess. Um, I'm thinking, and I, I know, that the low fundamental of this snare just kind of is sticking out a little bit too much for me. So I'm probably going to want to nip that back. And it's clearly not quite bright enough yet. So it's about finding a good spot on the uh, in the high end to boost and lift up some uh, some brightness. I'm going to turn the transient designer off at this point. Cool. I brought in the low pass filter just to tame a little bit of the extreme high end. Um, and then, yeah, just nipping back that that fundamental tone a little bit. It's just allowing the low end to still be there, but not have too much of like a noty quality to it. <laughs> Sounding about right. Um, let's bring in some processing. Now, you'll have seen me talking about these three plugins in that snare video if you saw it. If you haven't, check out the link below. Um, very standard settings for me here, just the default settings on um, the FG401 compressor, 4 to 1 ratio, um, second slowest attack, second fastest release, um, and I'm just pulling down the threshold until I'm getting a healthy amount of reduction, around 10 dB on the hard hits, and then I'm using the makeup game to compensate. So that's what this sounds like. I'll bypass these. Actually not quite hitting 10 dBs, but still a healthy amount at around 7 or 8 dBs. And then here we've got the brilliant custom series lift, uh, the present control there. As I mentioned in the other video, seems to be doing something around 4.5k, an area which I typically don't tend to touch on other EQs. And this just, 
yeah, I love doing it on this. This really helps get the snare to sound right in the context of the mix. And then finally some saturation, which I'm using to trim transient off the drum and make it sound right in the mix without it being too pointy. So um, I'm going to first of all dial in the saturation and then maybe we're going to take a listen in the mix as I work that um, high lift band there. So in context, Yeah, that's sounding really good like that. I should also just say that during the early revisions, getting the drum sound in the mix, I had quite a lot of back and forth with Matt, the drummer, who felt like he really wanted to hear that rim shots sounded like rim shots, was what he was saying. Like, he didn't want the snare drum to become something like what you hear on a lot of modern productions, which is kind of a very fat, almost kind of pillowy attack. Um, you know, he wanted it to sound more like it sounds when you sit behind the kit and hit the drum and you've got like that kind of stick attack coming through. So I think that's a little bit where this kind of presence lift thing came from. Um, and also maybe not scooping out too much of the mids on the snare drum either. Uh, if you watch my other video, you know, I was talking about how you can scoop a lot of kind of 900 or 1K out of a snare drum uh, and it sounds really kind of modern. It sounds a, a lot like some really popular samples that you find out that, that have been around for a while. Um, but it does tend to kind of scoop some character away, like it kind of makes drums sound quite similar. And also I think it has this effect if you kind of get rid of a bit of that kind of normal, organic, real sound of a stick hitting a, a snare drum. So you'll notice I didn't kind of go crazy with that. Um, and I think that, you know, this band here it ended up kind of way around there when, when we did the record, I think. Maybe the EQing I've done now is slightly different anyway going into it, but um, it was quite a lot of it that was required to make that come through in the mix. And I really do think that doing this in the mix is important because hearing that snare drum soloed before we moved to this segment, I was starting to feel like this wasn't very necessary at all. I thought I had quite a bright snare drum sound. Um, yet, once hearing it in the mix, I would turn this up much louder than I would have done if I hadn't. So if we listen to the snare in, in isolation. That's not as pleasant sounding to me as it was before. It's got this kind of sandpaperiness to it that works really well in the context of the mix. Remember that this is just a close mic that we're dealing with here. There's a lot of sound that's coming from the overheads and from the room. And that's filling out a lot of the mid-range and the punch and the, the carry of the drum. So in this mix style, at least, the way that I mix this record, it makes sense that I can push those upper mid frequencies on the, on the snare close mic quite a lot. And yet the end result doesn't sound really fake because we're incorporating a lot of kind of natural sound from the other elements. So there's only really one other thing which I did here, which was to um, put some reverb on the snare top. So I, I tend to like to send reverb now from the top only. I don't really like to get the bottom mic involved in that. Um, and I'd like to do it if I can before I've brightened up the signal too much. So actually what I'd done on this album mix was I duplicated the snare top mic onto a new channel with no processing on it, no gate, no nothing. So it's got all the cymbal bleed in there. Um, and I put a reverb directly on that set completely wet. So it's almost like a kind of another room channel kind of sound. Um, but because I haven't put lots of brightness into the snare before sending it to the reverb, it makes it sound just more, yeah, just 
better to me. It doesn't have any kind of zingy fizziness to it. So here I felt like since all I'd done on the top was this mid cut, I thought maybe, you know, that's that's fine. I'll send it from there. But I didn't send it from the snare bus itself. So, so this is what it sounds like if I were to hit play on that with the reverb on. And again, this is a reverb I've spoken about in a couple of other places and people have asked. Um, it's based on a preset in Chroma Verb called 80s Drums. Pretty sure I've modified it a little bit, but I don't know. You tell me. You look at the, the settings there. It's a bit of um, top end cut. And this, I think all of this um, kind of damping EQ is part of the preset. Uh, and then I'm cutting low end, so I'm, I'm using this kind of very broad low cut at about 200 hertz, plus an, an additional um, kind of bell cut around 200 hertz as well, just to take any mud out of it, make it sound... It's not, it's not airy, but it's, it's kind of tubular and not muddy sounding. I really like how that sounds. All right. Snare drum done. Okay, let's look at toms. So, three toms on this kit. They're all fairly low tuned, coated heads, Evans UV2s, mic'd with my Josephson ES22 mics. I will have an EQ on each tom, plus on the bus, all I have is a limiter. So I'm using that to take any peaks that are kind of overs when he's hitting the floor toms particularly hard off and also to just kind of globally boost the level up after that. So this is good old Waves L1, one of the most basic limiters there is. All right, so let's find a spot where all three toms are being hit. Let's take one of these uh, fills in the intro riff. So I think that's one there. Let's solo off the toms, take the limiter off. I've also got the reverb send bypass there as well. So um, let's look at the programming. So levels wise, again, look, I'm not programming the hardest hits ever. That's 100-ish at the hardest, but the second on each a bit softer um, so that they sound kind of fluttery instead of really rigid um, as you hear those kind of fast fills there. So let's check out the rack tom. And actually, let's do that transient designer thing again. I do use this on the kick as well, on the toms as well, to help figure out what's going on with the, the sound during that initial impact. Um, I found it really useful. And something else which you can do, which I probably should have mentioned in that video, is use it to help compare your sounds to others. So if there's a processed one-shot sample that you've got in your collection that you didn't make, and you want to be able to capture a bit of that vibe in a snare track that you have, or a kick track, whatever it is, then I find it can be more useful to compare and dial in by ear without the sustain bothering you, because it's unlikely you're going to have exactly the same source sound with the same, you know, tune the same, with the same overtones. So if you start chasing making that stuff sounding the same, um, you'll frequently miss the point, which is if you can get the stuff in the attack portion to sound right, you probably get a lot of that vibe um, of that sample in, in your own sound uh, while it's still having its own kind of unique character in its overtones and sustain. So anyway, that's an aside. Let's use this. It's probably not going to be super effective because of how much sustain is on a tom versus a snare. You're probably going to hear some sustain, but all the same, it's going to help us get our ear in on what's going on attack-wise. So I'm hearing this kind of like, kind of flappy character to the attack. So I'm thinking this probably, yeah, around kind of 1K plus or minus a bit, uh, an area that I could cut. And then also there's this kind of wheezing character to the mid range, which are the overtones of the, the tom, which for some styles of music are totally acceptable. Um, and probably on the record, I left more of that in than I might otherwise. Again, just kind of going for that organic drum sound. 
But I think for this mix, I'm going to try and scoop the tom out a little bit more. By the time I've done those two moves, we're going to see how how balanced the top and bottom end of the tom sounds, because we've got the the note of the tom at the bottom, and then we've got the the kind of the attack in the kind of higher up than the flappiness that I don't like. You know, the kind of more airy, um, plastic, kind of slappy character of the of the tom, which I'm going to want to enhance a bit. We'll see how that's balancing between those two and hopefully end up with a final EQ sound that sounds balanced. So I like the character of the drum, but that like the note is definitely sticking out a bit too much. So first of all, I'll see if I can just kind of use a high pass filter to, to tame that. But I'm not really getting the effect I want unless I kind of really cut all the low end out. So I think it might be a case of kind of finding the area where the note is and then using a bit of a cut but also a bit of a dynamic cut just to keep that note in check as it were so it doesn't kind of have too much of like a bloom to it but it's still quite present. sounding pretty good to me. Let's check out floor tom, uh, floor tom 1. So same kind of thing. I'll put the, the transient designer on. So do you remember what I was saying about the kick drum, where I was talking about the area directly above the fundamental having this very muddying effect on the sound of the kick drum and wanting to cut that out? I feel very similarly about floor toms, and this is a clear example. Even on the graph, you can see there's kind of a, a mound where the note of the drum is, and then there's another bit that's almost as big directly above it. And that stuff is really clouding the clarity of the floor tom. So let's get in there and cut that first. So as you can see, I'm playing with the Q value and the depth of that cut to try and get the, the kind of shape that I want. Um, and then, yeah, again, a bit of a flappy attack. Let's see if there's anything we can take out up, up a bit higher. But this is definitely way too dark and boomy sounding at the moment. Pretty good. Floor tom two. As you can see, that first overtone there is almost louder than the fundamental. So by controlling that, I think we're going to add a lot of clarity to the sound of this drum. But there's still a kind of wheezy character, and again, slightly flappy character to the, to the attack as well. Maybe we don't need to worry too much about that if we can just bring out a better sounding attack. Hmm, actually I think it was better with a bit of bit of cutting around there. So let's listen to the three toms together. I 
feel like floor tom one perhaps could use a little bit more brightness. Hmm. Or maybe it's maybe it's the upper mid range that's sticking out a bit too much on it. Cool. I always think it's worth checking all the toms being played together just to make sure that the attack is kind of sounding consistent between all of them. And that seems to be, I'd say that's pretty good. I, I generally don't do any kind of compression on the on the toms. Usually that's a bleed thing, like it's just going to bring up the bleed too much. But I also just generally don't think it needs that. Um, typically, if you try and exaggerate the attack, then they end up sounding really thin. And if you use a, like a fast attack on a compressor, then you just make them sound really kind of bloated sounding. Some styles of music, that's great, but yeah, just leaving them raw like that tends to work for me most of the time. Uh, but I am going to stick this limiter on. That's going to make it a lot louder. So actually, let's go back to to uh, zero, and I'll just bring that in and then show you how I'm getting that level in the mix. We don't want to hear it distorting too much on those low notes. A little bit's fine, a little bit's just a little bit of saturation, but I wouldn't want it to go much harder than that there. And then that in context. That's cool. Um, and then some verb on there, same reverb that I'm using for the snare. Just looking for kind of heavy tom moments just to check that EQ is working. That pre-delay on the reverb sounds pretty crazy in isolation on that. So um, maybe so if, if I were mixing and I noticed that, then my thought would be to automate down the reverb during that section. Um, just because it's being played enough that you probably don't need the reverb. And yeah, it's just kind of got a strange character to it <laughs> um, when it's being played like that. So. So that's uh, kick, snare, and toms. There's not too much more to do, really. Um, the rest of the mix is very basic. So the cymbals, I've, I've bussed the hats, the spots, and the overheads together to a bus. And all I have going on is a high pass. I'm cutting a bit of this kind of harsh upper mid-range, lower treble area around 6K. So I'll show you what that sounds like. Um, just find it softens the sound of the cymbals a little bit in a pleasant way. I don't really like when they're too brash in that area. Plus, that's going into that EQ that's on my drum bus with the 5.5k boost, so um, it makes sense. This might actually be kind of compensating a little bit for that. But um, yeah, that's pretty much all I feel like the overheads need, really, in terms of EQ. Um, I'm doing some quite heavy compression, so um, the classic mode on FabFilter Pro C2. Uh, with a very fast attack and kind of, yeah, fairly fast release. Uh, ratio of around five. I mean, none of this is super specific, but basically what I'm trying to do is really squash the overheads, but then I'm only blending in this compression effect at about 40% mix. So uh, there's still a lot of the dry sound. And that's just going to make sure that you can hear all the lower dynamic stuff, all the quieter cymbals that are being played. Um, and it also adds to the excitement and makes the shells sound a little bit more lively as well, which adds together with these close mic sounds that we've been getting to get, um, yeah, just this kind of more organic picture of the kit. So 
that's the setting which I like to use a lot. And this is followed up by Soothe. I actually have a preset. If you have Soothe 2, it'll be in, in the menu as default called Nolly Symbol Smooth. I still use that all the time. I think maybe the default preset has the depth knob turned up a bit higher, but I tend to use it a bit, a bit more conservatively now. And what Soothe does is it dynamically suppresses the overtones, like the harshness in the symbols. Um, whereas before, it was pretty common for me and other people to go and like manually notch certain frequencies in the symbols that were ringing through really loudly. With this, it just does all of that for you and you don't need to think about it. So it makes the symbols just sound that bit more kind of final and polished, basically. If I use the delta button, that will show you what it's taking out. It will show you the difference and you'll be able to hear what it's doing. It's subtle, but I just I just love it so much. It's so good. So that's the symbols bus, um, and then finally, so I decided not to use the mono room. I didn't use it on the record, um, and decided not to use it here. It's a cool sound. I'll show you what it sounds like. And you know, if you saw the walkthrough video, I explained that that mic's just in front of the kick drum. It's mostly trying to get some sound off the resonant side of the kick. But it's just not something which I, I find myself reaching for in this mix. What I am all about is the sound of the room mics. As I mentioned before, what I've done is raise the level of the snare and cut a little bit of level of the kick in the room mics. And this is a sum of both sets of stereo room mics, which are in a very similar position up on the mezzanine behind the kit. So we've got a stereo pair of C414s and a stereo AEA ribbon mic in the middle. Um, and I love how both of these two sound together. You've got the splash and brightness off the condensers, and then you have this really solid, meaty kind of sounding um, center picture of the kit. And it's just so good at rejecting cymbals. I don't think it's literally rejecting cymbals, but just the sound of that ribbon mic so naturally feels like the cymbals have been brought down in level. So um, all I really needed to do to this was kind of mess with the transient designer to bring up some sustain and cut some attack. I like using these instead of compressors now. By these, I mean transient designers, just because it's a bit more transparent. You can preserve a bit more of the natural balance of the kit. So, you know, the snare drum still cuts through in a way that once you start compressing, it just completely disappears. You know, you've got, it can sound amazing and gloopy and cool and big and explosive, but the cymbals become as, just as loud as the snare drum, and that makes it a far less usable channel in the mix for me. So, um, without it sounds like this. Something else which I like to do is send a bit of that to a reverb as well, just to make it sound a bit even bigger and kind of gloopier and more lush. So I've got a reverb send on there. And then it's just a question of finding a good level of that in the mix. So here's the, the drum mix without. And that's basically it. That's the drum mix, very heavily modeled off the sound of the actual record. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty light on processing. I suppose the kick is probably the most sculpted and changed sound out of the kit, but for the most part, it's just about enhancing the good elements and just cutting a bit of unwanted overtone from the close mics. And that's just about it, really. So yeah, that's the drum mix. I think probably the only bit of the drum mix which I had to keep from the original was Matt yelling two, three, four when doing the stick clicks. <laughs> which just, uh, yeah, they needed to remain uh, in order to keep the song sounding right. <laughs> and that, I did actually use the front of kick. Um, so the, the mono room mic was the one that I, I chose to use to, to <laughs> that was an overdub. 
obviously on the record um as you can hear there's no symbol overhanging it but um yeah that that was the mic that i chose to use for that so <laughs> Drums done. All right, let's take a look at some of the other elements. So next down the list is bass. Right, so bass. There's a bit of an elephant in the room as far as I'm concerned with this. So yeah, I designed a signature pedal with dark glass called the Adam which I think is awesome. I recently used it um, to play on stage with Sixth, which was an amazing experience. I just had playing with them on stage at the Arc Tangent Festival. And I stand by it. I think it's an awesome product. It would have only made sense for me to use it on this record. That would have been the most sensible thing in the world. And yet I didn't. As it happened, I recorded the bass over quite a long period of time. I was recording direct. Um, and I wanted just consistency and I thought I'd decide on the tone later in the process. So I was monitoring using uh, Neural's Parallax plugin, which many people will know in the production world um, as being an incredible sounding uh, all in one kind of solution for grindy bass tone. And to be honest, it just sounded so good and became such a part of the sound, you know, just sending my, my bounces to the band of my bass tracks for them to um, approve Everyone commented on how great it sounded and it just became the thing which I used on the mix. So yeah, I, I've, I kind of feel weird about the fact that I didn't use that dark glass pedal, which I designed fairly close to working on this album. Really would have been the perfect outing for it, but I just I was just so happy with the parallax sound that that's what I stuck with. So um, yeah, parallax. What you've got here is my bass DI. my raw takes here. So I should point out, you know, this is a really, this is an uncompressed raw bass DI. And I just want to make a point, which is if you're tracking a bassist or if you are a bassist, you should be aiming for the most consistency that you can possibly have for your bass track to sound audible and consistent and cool in the mix. <laughs> um, if you look at something like this, if you look at the waveforms when I'm on one note, They are really consistent in level and shape. And that shape is showing the release of the, the pick on the string. Obviously, that first hit, I must have hit a little bit emphatically to start with. Um, but you can see that, you know, just the shape, if you look at like a group like, I don't know, over here, wherever you see like a slightly thicker kind of arrow shape, that's the pick attack. And you can see that it just looks really nice and consistent. And that's something which I really, you know, I, I love to be able to see the DI when I'm tracking because I'm, I'm looking for that consistency because it means that I'm not going to have to use compression to get consistency in the sound. And I've said consistency a load of times in this sentence, but it really is key. That's like your role as a bassist is to support the low end of the mix and bind with the guitars in a way that makes more than a sum of the parts where both the guitars and the bass are enhanced by one another and together they create this huge wall of sound that dominates the mix without um, swamping everything. And I just can't stress enough how much having a consistent performance, so even sounding picking with a similar amount of low end content in every note in the raw DI, I just can't stress how much that does to make that part of your life easier. So yeah. 
that's just a little aside on, on base production. Um, let's look at what I did to it. Now, as consistently as I tried to play, different strings are going to have quite different volumes. So if you're picking at one strength on, say, the fourth string and you move to the fifth, it's quite normal to see a big change in amplitude. So um, the compressor is going to help with that. And it's also going to enhance the overtones. So instead of having to use loads of distortion to, to get that sound, um, to, to make the harmonic sound stable, so that when you put that next to the guitars, which are super compressed, um, the bass stays audible all the time, or the overtones and harmonics of the bass sound audible all the time. Instead of distorting, doing some heavy compression on the DI will really help with that. We're still going to distort as well, but this just means we don't have to distort as much. <laughs> So Parallax, I just think Parallax is so good. I'm fully compressing the low band um, below 170 hertz here. I'm not distorting like crazy, um, and I'm definitely controlling the mid-range so it's not super loud. Um, but yeah, this is just such a great sound. And I'm using this with an IR which I made. It's an IR which I can't share because I made it for the dark glass pedal. Um, it's, a, yeah, it's a blend of a few different bass cabs that, and, and a guitar cab that I captured and yeah, it's a big part of the sound of the pedal. It's a big part of the sound of, of um, this particular tone. But, um, you know, if you find any good IR for bass, you'll probably be able to get good results with this, with this settings here. Next up, and I'm just showing you what I did like I don't have the best memory of every move that I made or why but we can take a little look it looks like I'm boosting a little bit of 1.5k which is funny considering that I cut it on one of the graphic use EQ sliders in parallax it just is what it is um, and it also looks like I'm boosting oh and usually I'm boosting about 120 Hertz there <laughs> I do find that range kind of 1K to 1.5K just so important for modern bass guitar, just to get those really quite kind of, what's the best way to describe them? I mean, it, it is the clank of the bass, but specifically when they're stretched out and overtony like that, it's just a, it's this amazing sound that's, I, I think is very much what Meshuggah were referring to when they said they wanted their bass guitar to sound like an oil tanker being dragged across rubble or whatever it was that they said, which I think is a very apt description for modern bass tone. Um, so in addition to those EQ moves, I am also compressing a little bit with this channel. So there's also a little bit of compression going on and the expander is left on on this preset as well, although the threshold is set pretty low. Yeah, 3 to 6 dBs of gain reduction there. Next up, we've got two instances of FabFilter Pro Q3. So let's see what I was doing. So on the first one here, I'm boosting some 900. That can be a cool move. Again, so good for that kind of honky character in the mix. It looks like I brightened it up a little bit with an extra bit of 5 and a bit K. And then I'm kind of cutting where I was boosting on the SSL, so that doesn't make much sense. But I'm using a dynamic band there and also boosting a bit lower down. So it looks like I'm kind of revoicing the low end a little bit here. Really subtle stuff though, to be honest. And then it looks like I'm doing a bit more of the same here for whatever reason, and that I'm pretty sure should just be deleted. It uh, looks like I'm, yeah, kind of doing a dynamic cut and boost at the same time around 120 and um, a shelving cut at about 285. Now, as I mentioned, when doing the P4 mix walkthrough, you know, in, in the real, in the heat of battle in mixing, when you're dealing with um, also client revisions and stuff, sometimes it makes sense to 
be doing things in a way where they can easily be reversed. Like, you know, maybe if someone on the band said they wanted a little bit more like kind of thickness rather than low end on the bass. Maybe that's why I brought in this second EQ here and boosted around there, but wanted to control it with a dynamic band so it didn't get too out of control. And then maybe I also felt like that was balancing things in general too far towards the low end. So I introduced this low shelf cut. I don't know if that's the reason, but you know, it's easy for things to end up looking quite complicated um, when you come back and dissect them after the fact. But instead of integrating all of these things into a single set of EQ moves, um, it can sometimes make sense to have them in separate stages so it's easy to, to be able to go back through when you're in the middle of the process uh, and bypass certain things to see if you think they're better or not, rather than it being just a fraction of one particular EQ setting. So that's my excuse anyway. And then finally, I had Track Spacer on, sidechain to the kick drum, but basically I'm using it to... Um, duck a little bit. I've only got the ratio set to 11.5%. Uh, it's ducking below 80 hertz, down to 20 hertz, based on when the kick drum hits. So let's see what that sounds like. I think depending on your monitoring system, that could be quite hard to hear. It is hard to hear. It's kind of like, it's just preventing the bass from building up too much, basically. And especially, you know, going from a section like these big ringing out notes in the chorus where you want the low end to carry and be solid um, straight into something where there's more of like a kind of heavy double kick presence where you don't want the low end of the mix to get really crazy. I think it can be really useful to employ something like track spacer or a multi-band compressor with a side chain input, something like that. I think track spacer is brilliant though. So that rounds out the bass processing. getting carried away there. It's quite satisfying just to hear those tones together. So let's look at the rhythm guitars. I'm using what I was sent by Misha. And I don't know the full story behind these tracks. I know that what he sent me were different guitar tracks for different songs. Um, this bus is called Neural Guitars, but that's actually just a hangover from a previous session where we had one set of guitars that were all live reamps and one that were all neural um, DSP generated tones. And um, we went with the neural DSP tones on that one. In this case, it appears as a bit of a mix because these top two are labeled guitar one and uh, L and two R invective. So those would have been reamped through his PV invective amp. Um, this one here, Omega Gojira, my guess is that's going to be the neural Omega amp with the Octava from Gojira. So that seems right to me. You know, going into this record, really high up my priority list philosophy wise was to lean heavily into the tones that the band members liked and created and I think these are cool guitar tones and I, I mean they're not necessarily tones that I would have dialed in myself or could have dialed in myself but the most important thing to me was that it's what Misha loved when he was playing these rhythm tracks and the rest of the band too when they were there um and that in the mix, I'm just trying to lean into those positive qualities of uh, the tones that they liked rather than trying to construct something from scratch and, you know, kind of control freak everyone to death with creating every tone and kind of taking that stuff out of that out of their hands. So yeah, that goes also for 
making sure the snare rim shots sound like rim shots, like I mentioned before, with the drums or, um, you know, that being Matt's preference or when we get to the vocals, that the vocals have the qualities that Spencer looks for in his own voice or the lead guitars sound like the lead guitarist wanted them to sound. So um, bear that in mind with this, you know, I think it's a really healthy perspective to carry into any creative work, actually, where you're collaborating with, with other people is to allow their voice to come through as much as possible and just lean into the positive qualities of it because that way you'll get something unique for you and unique to them. And that's something which I think both you as a mixer will come back and cherish in the, in the future and that the artist for sure is really going to appreciate uh, when they listen back across their music and don't feel like it sounds differently to how they would have wanted it to sound or that they don't hear their own unique character in there or something like that. So, yeah, a bit of a bit of a sidetrack there but I do think it's important to to think about these things even if you're only coming in as a mixer it can be really nice to talk to the band get a vibe for how things were recorded and how they got the tones that they wanted and to think about maintaining those in the mix so yeah we've got the first uh, pair of guitars which are reamped to the invective as kind of a core rhythm sound we've got some octave guitar, guitar sounds which are really just there to thicken the main tone and then down here we've got Omega uh, tracks again. That could well have been reamped because Misha has an actual Omega Granifier amp. Um, so that might not be the neural. It might be his actual amp. I don't know. But the whole record was like this a big mix of different amps and different plugins. And every song is different, and different sections might lean more on one than another. And that's something I had nothing to do with, but I was very happy to just work with in the context of the mix. You'll also notice a few points where there's automated moves on what I've been sent, volume moves, um, which, again, I'm totally up for embracing and not trying to say I have to recreate all of that myself. So, for example, before the really genty section, <laughs> um, when the intro riff comes back, you can see that that one guitar there gets bumped up hugely in volume. That's both because we're going from a section that has six guitars playing to, or six tracks, to uh, two. Uh, but it's also to give it that effect of like there's a really heavy bus compressor that's just releasing at that point, which is something, it's a character that you hear, for example, in the old Bulb demos. He used to mix into really heavy um, master compression. I'm talking really early days kind of stuff. And it, it always gave a cool vibe to what he was doing, even if it was a little bit over the top. So... Now, for me, that's like a little nod to the sound of periphery and bulb music as it first came out. So um, I really like that. And that's something which I carry forward into other mixes as well. It's like when you have those moments, don't be afraid to make the guitar really jump up in volume. So it sounds like heavy compression lifting and then slamming back in again on the next impact. And that is, that is gent, guys. That is gent. Um, that sound where you're really hearing the fifth in the power chord, kind of more than the root almost. That's, that's for me, what gent is. Um, and it was clear that Misha was really going for that on that section. Like that. Sorry, this, I'm going on such a diatribe here, but... That... The fifth... That's gent. Okay, cool. Um, let's uh, let's get into what I actually did to these guitars. So they're all just at Unity, left with the levels that he sent me. Um, I'm using a gain plugin, yeah, just to trim back because these are all pretty hot tracks um, before any processing. Then I'm using our GGD Zilla Soft now. This is a setting that Misha used when he was tracking, and it seems to be a sound that he really likes. So again, instead of me coming in and you know, changing everything up. I thought it's cool to work with his sound. I did try, and we tried. We tried using Kali and some other impulses, Kali being a GTD plugin, um, Mesa Boogie Cab Sim. Um, and we, in the end, decided, although there were good sounding options, that it was better just to run with the one that sounded like Misha and how he intended it to. So um, you can see the settings there. You could copy them if you want. I've got the master EQ on. 
If I was to take off any of the processing that comes afterwards, the guitars still sound very much in the same vein. Let's um, look at what comes afterwards. So next up is an EQ. This is also something which I got from Misha. This is the EQ curve that he liked when he was mixing. So I was just kept that in place. Kind of brightening and taming a couple of resonant frequencies in the mids. That's a cool sounding EQ. Next up, we've got uh, FabFilter Pro MB, which I'm using as a multiband compressor to compress the palm mutes. Actually, it looks like it's doing more than just the palm mutes, but keeping the low ends very flat then. You can see it's kicking in just on the, on the chugs. Um, we've got a little bit of stereo widening, just a tiny bit. And finally, a little bit of EQ is, and I've got the feeling that this was also something which Misha had. Maybe I've tweaked these and maybe I tweaked the, the Pro Q3 a little bit, but again, I just very much wanted to roll with what he was comfortable with because it wouldn't necessarily occur to me to boost 200 on guitar, um, but it seemed to be what he wanted and it sounds cool. <laughs> So that's the guitar tone, and if I were to put that with the bass... Let me just go back to the bass for a second to show you how much that 900 hertz is doing on the bass. I mean, 900, 1K, it's all kind of in that area just does so much to bring the bass forwards and make it sound so just hard. I don't know how to describe it. It's so like, so clangy and, and amazing sounding. Cool, let's look at some of the guitar layers. So all of these tracks up here didn't have any cab models printed into them. We did that deliberately, or Misha did that deliberately, so that if we did want to mess with the cab sound, we could. Uh, however, for the layers, I told him just to go ahead and print in the cab sounds he was using. And by layers, I mean lower gain stuff, ambient effecty stuff, leads. Um, so that's what we've got here. Note, that's also got ambience printed into it. That's not something I'm adding. I've literally just got an EQ on there and I'm trimming the gain. And I like that, again, I like to work with that kind of thing where, you know, the artist has decided how it should sound and it's just my job to mix it. I'm not trying to engineer something fresh. So that was the, the solo I happened to click on, but I think we'll find the same is going on on everything. Yeah, it's just EQs, if anything. Actually, a bunch of these don't have anything on them. Ambient guitars, one, washi lead, jazz guitar, no EQ on any of them. It's literally just level. Since it's in this group of guitars, let's just talk briefly about the jazz break. This is very much 
in that list of things which I did very little to. The jazz drums came from Misha with some pretty crazy kind of glitching effects on them. He created this, I'm pretty sure, with the GGD Benny Greb library. Those are those glitch effects. So it looks like I treated it with the good old Corniff talkback limiter. which it seems I'm using more for the tone than for the compression because the compression's off, but it does have quite a specific sound to it. So yeah, that's on there. And that's it. As far as the bass goes, he sent me some programmed bass, I think. Just controlling the low end with a bit of dynamic EQ and compressing with some fairly light very Muse style compression here from um, MJ Using. I'd have to ask him, but I'm fairly sure that's got some room impulse on it, either from the Zilla program or from the GGD Goldstack um, cab plugin. Those are the two we've done that have ambience, and that sounds like a like an, an actual cab in a room ambience rather than a reverb. So we've got guitar, bass, uh, drums, there's the piano. Got a limiter on there, I think just for when it gets a bit louder in the solo. It's not doing anything currently. Cutting some mids and trimming some gain. great name to these files actually that I got sent from Misha. Piano totally played by Misha. No doubt about that then. Uh, and then the sax solo which came from Jürgen Munkeby from um, Shining and Emperor and Yoga Yazist etc. It just sounds amazing. I'll show you the, the raw sax sound we got sent. He's a really good engineer, so I'm sure he put loads of stuff on there. You can see from the, you know, the way it kicks in at the start, there's some, just looking at the waveform, I mean, you can see there's some pretty heavy compression on there, um, which I found maybe a little bit distracting. So I decided to use Spiff, which I just love. I love this plugin so much um, for cutting transient stuff um, in a way that sounds really smooth and natural. So this is just smoothing out those impacts. If I show you without, well, that's with, this is without. that plug-in and then I added a bit more reverb. I really love this reverb too and I love how simple it is. Um, I find myself reaching for this quite a lot if I just want a nice ambient enveloping sounding reverb, the sound toys little plate. And that's all of the elements no, it's not. It's not all of the elements of the jazz so, uh, the jazz break, but nearly. There's some breakbeat drum. I assume analog synth. I'm not entirely sure. And the breakbeat stuff has some EQ on it. All right. That's an aside for the jazz break. We are into the synth tracks. Let's check out what's going on there. So for the most part, they're impacts during this track. So we've got things like... Another great track name, very catchy melody. So 
So that's something, you know, cool programming that Misha's done to support the guitar lick that's in the rhythm guitars. Kind of sounds like a string meets organ kind of vibe. I don't know, I don't know how he made that sound, but it's in there. And a lot of this stuff is just a question of finding a cool level for it where it sits into the mix well and yeah, where it just does its job of reinforcing what's there without really sticking its neck out too far. Here, uh, I'm doing this move that I really love to do where um, I'm cutting some, some mids on the mid channel only. And that's just what I call like clarity in the mid range for the rest of the mix because it's taking away from this kind of muddy area, 300 hertz-ish, um, down the center of the mix where you've got the kick, the bass, the snare drum, the vocal. Um, so anything which you can do to kind of alleviate a bit of pressure in the low mids there still allow it to remain on the sides where it's not fighting so much with the, those kind of lead instruments, um, but just kind of, you know, give a bit of um, clarity to the center channel, um, I find to be a huge win. So that's just on that bus. And then beyond that, the impact sample has nothing on it. The piano we went through, sub drop has nothing on it. The end chords, nothing, nothing, nothing. A bit of EQ on the breakbeat drums as we spoke about, and nothing on the choir and nothing on the glitch break. So apart from that, it's all just as provided. Again, not trying to do stuff that the band didn't want. You know, they like how they sound and unless there's something wrong with it, I'm just gonna keep it as is and find a level that works in the mix. All right, so that brings us up to vocals. Let's have a look. So I'm doing more processing on this, but Spencer has provided me with quite heavily processed tracks here. Again, he's a great vocalist, he's a great engineer. He didn't need me to work from his raw sounds and I didn't need to do that either you know I could just take what he gave me and work with it a bit more to get it to work in my mix initially I tried not to compress it more because as you can see it's already a pretty compressed waveform but I found that there was a bit of extra compression necessary to make it sound right let's check out the raw vocal sound here on the main screams I wait, I wait to find me. Let the time is now. You never would have thought this is the new. So there's a bit of like a kind of howling frequency in his voice, like. Long way, long way to find me. Would have thought this is the new me. And what I found is I wanted to cut that with a dynamic cut kind of thing, but at the same time it then made the voice sound a bit too kind of weirdly scooped. So I came up with this move that I quite like and I've used a lot since, which is to do a kind of narrow cut, sometimes dynamic, and then do a wide boost in a similar area so that between the two, things stay, I don't know, stay really musical sounding. If I bypass those moves and then show you what it sounds like with them on. Long way, long way to find me! Let the time is now! I never would have thought this is the new me! So many people! So because I find with vocals in particular, once you try and overcorrect things, like if you try and just completely wipe out stuff that you don't like, it can quickly end up not sounding like a voice anymore or just sounding weirdly scooped when you put it into the mix. So that was a move that worked really well for me on this and elsewhere in the record. As well as, I mean, that is so subtle, I can't imagine it's even really audible, but that's boosting a tiny bit of air into the voice with um, a bit of a dynamic cut happening at the same time. So that's there. And then using a vocal compression preset that I really like to use, which is, you know, that's boosting the 10 dB of 8K in the side chain. So it's kind of acting as a bit of a de as well as a compressor. So we've already got very compressed vocals. Doing this this way means that the assets don't get completely out of control. Long way, long way to find me! Let the time is now! I never would have thought! Next, that plugin Spiff that I mentioned before. Again, it's just really nice at rounding over some hard edges, compression artifact, artifacts, um, plosives, hard consonants, just makes things sound really nice and smooth. You take the long way, long way to find me! Let the time! If I show you the delta so you hear what's being removed. Never would have thought this is the 
I just really like what that's doing to the vocal. And then on the bus, we've got some more EQ, kind of doing similar things, cutting a bit of mids. Um, there's a narrow cut followed by a wide boost, uh, dynamic cut and boost pair. There's another thing which I like doing, like boosting an area but using a dynamic um, band to also kind of cut when it's in action. You kind of get back to flat again, but in this way that sounds more controlled, as well as cutting a little bit of 2K. A lot of this stuff, I mean, I couldn't replicate it exactly um, you know, for a second time. It's just stuff which happened during the mix, reacting. I had a lot of back and forth with Spencer during this mix process, making sure that he was happy with his voice and getting it to sit in the mix just right. So, you know, a lot of these things were specific to his feedback as well. So this is what it sounds like with the EQ on the bus. You take the long way, wrong way to find me! And the time is now! I never would have thought this is the new me! Again, not trying to completely change his voice, but just make it sound a little bit smoother, a little bit less kind of full of overtones, and um, but still sound very much like Spencer. Next, we've got some stereo compression here. I'm using, I, I love this plugin, the Purple Audio MC77. It's such a great sounding 1176 style compressor. Just got this really kind of goopy quality to it. I don't know how to describe it. It's really um, great on anything you put it on. It just makes everything sound really kind of congealed in a good way. Long way, long way to find me! And I've got this in MS mode as well, mid-side. Um, and it probably makes more sense to hear it with the other vocals in place as well, because the idea is that as backing vocals and doubles come in and out, the overall volume doesn't change quite as much because of the fact that they're all going through a compressor together. Ready to face it, face it! As I'm falling to pieces, the vultures are facing! We break the precipice! Long way down! Now I'll say! After the purple audio compressor, we've got Soothe, which is so good at knocking out kind of unpleasant overtones and harshness in the voice, very similarly to the kind of stuff which I like to do on cymbals. Um, I find it really cool to do that on, on voice as well, so. Long way, long way to find me! If I put the delta on. The time is now! I never would have thought this is the new me! So many people, so many faces left! Oh, me! Get all the imperfections they show! Heart bay! Heart's me! When all the bad times stick, and I don't know what to do with them! I'm burning like wildfire! So some of those examples there of, of on that word wildfire, for example, having that compressor on the vocal bus is just controlling the whole thing, ducking the main vocal a little bit as the sides happen. Um, it's just, yeah, for me, it's good practice to have a compressor on the bus as well, even if it's not doing a huge amount. But I will say with the vocals, something that Spencer felt really strongly about and that I thought was cool is he wanted when extra vocals came in for them to really jump out of the speakers. Um, and I feel like you can hear that really nicely on several points on the record. For example, first verse in Zagreus, there's some very cool syncopated um, words like on that line, now pay for it, I think it is, where suddenly all of these extra voices come in, really bumped up in volume, but because it's so tight and percussive, it's just like really impressive rather than kind of taking you out of the moment. Same kind of thing going on here as well. Also, he's called this main screens, but obviously it's got clean vocals on it as well in the choruses. I'm burning like wildfire. Um, as you can hear, there's definitely a bit of a sibilant quality to the voice, so I found that it was necessary to use a de as well. I don't often use de but especially if I'm using spiff and that compression setting that's boosting a lot of high end in the side chain, but it seemed like a good idea here. I'm burning like wildfire! Send me fucking out of this! Oh, heart beat! me! Cause all the bats I'm staying, and I don't know what I'm doing here! So here I am using a little bit of that revival plugin that I mentioned earlier um, on the voice, just giving him a little bit more air up top. I'm burning like wildfire! Send me fucking out of this! Oh, heartbeat! 
it's just a nice little bit of extra polish and that probably came from feedback from him or someone in the band for wanting just a little bit more air on top of his voice. That's all of the vocal treatment. There are these ambience channels which he sent me, so we've got... You know, just pure 100% wet reverb and delays, which do change throughout the track. Every song's got different treatment as well. Um, and then, so there's one of those for the, for the main voice and one for the backings as well. And I just sent it all through the same bus here with the compressor on it and everything. So all the vocals together sound like, well, I'll show you in a second, but what I will say is having the, the, the reverbs and everything going through the compressor does give you a little bit of a ducking kind of sound where as the vocals are loud, it's ducking the ambience. And as they go quiet or cut out, the ambience comes up in volume. And that kind of interplay can be quite cool on vocals. Sometimes it's not suitable. Sometimes it's better to completely separate those things, but here it didn't seem to be an issue. So I think that's it really. There's just a couple of other things in this session which I haven't shown. So there's a tiny little blob of ambience here at the end that should probably be up here with the you know, with the additional production because it's clearly some kind of reverse synth sound. Which leads into this um, kind of blast beat outro thing that I think is just designed to be a bit of a shock to the system. I do remember there was some kind of back and forth about the timing, like when it should kick in. There's no tempo change in the song. This is programmed at like 16th note triplets and it comes in at a really weird spot. It's like not on a bar line. <laughs> um, so all the channel, all the tracks are kind of shifted over and bless Joe Hamilton from GGD Socks when he recreated um, the drums for most of this, he had to take that into account and shift it all so that it matched up with the, uh, the drums, which yeah, just not, not on the, uh, on the grid at all where they start um, for this outro. Okay, I think that's it. This has been pretty epic to go through. Uh, it feels like this has been pretty long, um, but hopefully you guys have stayed interested, especially for the first section where we're mainly talking about the drum sounds. And, you know, I hope there's some stuff which might be applicable to your own mixes and productions. And I also hope that it might give you some confidence to work with the sounds within the P5 library um, without using the turbo functions, although I'm really proud of the pre-processing that that does, you know, the turbo function within the plugin is using inbuilt processing inside contact. So it's a bit like a stock plugin mix with quite a limited number of plugin inserts and frequency bands. So there's only so much I can do with it, but I felt like I got it to a pretty cool place. However, there's definitely more detail that you can go into if you route it out and do some mixing in, the, in your door, um, as we did here, especially for elements like the kick drum, which had that quite complicated revoicing EQ thing going on. Um, and yeah, beyond that, what can I say? Thanks very much for all the support. If you've seen previous mixed tutorials of mine, I hope that you still found some new stuff in there of, of interest. I will say for me personally, whenever I do show my work, you know, my, my workflow and my, my mixed tips and my ideas for processing, pretty much instantly that then means that the next thing I do, I kind of want to try and find something new just so that I've got something new to share and also to not be just reusing the same tricks every time. So. Hopefully this is something that's going to, you know, kick me into gear to find some new and interesting ways to, to mix as well. Um, but I think that's it. Thanks very much for staying with me through all of this. I hope you've enjoyed and yeah, until next time.